too many of us focus on sort of in the box, in the core, but that is a very important thing. And um, yes, we do need a lot of work on outside the core, very interesting things to do there, very important as well. But we also, if we're going to be promoting this worldwide to governments, et cetera, we need to start to get a better, better handle on well, what's going to be in that box. But that said, there is no real reason to try to rush to, okay, this is exactly the way we're going to go. Uh, it's probably quite realistic to think we're going to go forward with several options. So I want to try to give a flavor for decision making on this. Now, I have a lot of slides. I'm going to skip a lot of things. My second talk will be a little bit uh, uh, more leisurely. But I'll try to mention first that almost all the designs with molten salt, uh, liquid fluoride reactors, they have a lot in, in similarity. So advantages to all reactor designs, first off, is the safety. And again, I'll sort of, people can read these slides later, but we don't have a pressure vessel. Basically, uh, no driving forces to want to move radiation anywhere. Um, and the radioactive products that want to come out of the salt come out passively already. We collect them so they're not around in any accident. And almost any design you can think of has very, very common safety issues. There's some reactivity issues that are a little different in others. Potential for low cost. And uh, I don't need to speak much because Pear did a great job on this. Uh, a lot of it boils down to the excellent coolant nature of the, um, of the molten salts in general. That has a trickle-down effect on the building size, construction layout, how much you can fa fabricate. Very high thermal efficiency on either steam or gas. That's the one area I'll throw in a, a shout out to. Uh, don't forget about steam because steam, at least we have things that are developed now. Developing gas cycles, unfortunately, you've got a great uh, benefit for your nth reactor, your reactors later down the road, but that first plant, can, that first turbine can be quite expensive to make. We can use what's being used now with uh, uh, ultra supercritical steam uh, from the coal industry. Pierre, this tries to elaborate the case a little bit better here about component size. Um, on the left, we have from the molten salt debris reactor. Um, Take the handheld mic with you, so we can... Oh, yeah, sorry. We have the two components on the left are the steam generators and the primary heat exchanger. There's four, 4,000 megawatts. There's four primary heat exchangers, 16 of these little U-tubes that were involved. Compared to a PWR with a massive steam generator, because again, the, the, the qualities of the, the steam and coolant, and as well with the molten salt fuel designs at least, we have these really large temperature margins uh, between your primary and secondary. Compared to a fast breeder, they always show the very tiny little core that they can get by with, uh, but the poor nature of sodium, they have, well, this is based on the PRISM design, about six and a half of these incredibly large steam generators and 13 of these large primary heat exchangers. So there's a lot of potential savings there. Um, resource sustainability, the pure thorium cycle is, of course, the best. We're only really needing a, a, a thousand tons of thorium per year after startup. Startup is an issue. We need something to, to start these up. Uh, other designs at most might require some modest amounts of uranium, uh, and I'll talk more about that in my second talk. Uh, very low, long-lived radiotoxicity. It's mainly the higher actinides that are the problem, the need for the yucca mountain type uh, things. Um, all the designs have benefit here, and I'll get back to that more later. Uh, I won't really go through this slide. I often put it in. It's comparing the radiotoxicity. The blue line is from the actinides, and you can see how a PWR, that's really all the issue. The dashed line is the fission products. After 500 years, they're basically down to very benign levels. Um, the lower green line is for a molten salt reactor. Now, that said, what differentiates? What guides us to uh, what molten salt design is better than others? First off is how much R&D is required and the, uh, the level of technological uncertainty. What do we have to prove? What do we have to risk? Ten years of work that might hit a dead end. Uh, startup requirements of the physical material and thus deployability. Uh, can we use low enriched uranium? Um, how much physical do we need, et cetera, for cost and availability? Whether fission product removal is required, not all designs do, and if so, it's degree of difficulty, and there's a lot of variation in that. Reactivity coefficients, there's some variations there, and then degree of perforation resistance. Uh, all designs are quite good. Um, I find it hard to argue much difference between a light water reactor and the pure cycle, but we can Oak Ridge did a lot of work in increasing these even further. Uh, first question then is the breeder or converter, and of course I'm going to be talking about breeder because that's sort of what my this first talk is about. They offer the ultimate in resource usage, but at we have capital costs and R&D costs for the fuel processing. None of these processes, we've shown them in the lab, uh, but there's going to be a lot of work to, to, to prove them. 
Converters require an outside physical source, but greatly simplify everything else. Now, I, I said I'm going to talk about breeder design, so I want to go through some of the main designs that have been looked at, some of the problems, and then some proposed solutions. So we have the, the conventional single fluid graphite, uh, the DMSR breeder, which was sort of late, uh, late 70s, early 80s at Oak Ridge, uh, a one and a half fluid design, which is sort of a nickname that Oak Ridge came up with. Uh, and I'll show the French design that was called the TMSR, Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. They've switched names now, just recently, Molten Salt Fast Reactor. Uh, interlaced two fluid, that's the Oak Ridges from the mid 60s. And then what about not interlacing those two fluids? And that's going to lead into the tube within tube design that I'm uh, promoting. Uh, now the molten salt breeder reactor, again, uh, I won't go through too much detail here, but in the red, it shows sort of your, your primary containment. Uh, you have the same three levels that the light water reactor people have. Your primary loop is the first level of containment. Uh, that's all within a tight, high temperature, um, a secondary containment, and then you have your containment building around that. Um, advantages of that design, uh, very simple core, there's no structural material in the core in a strong neutron flux, the outer vessel gets a little bit of neutrons, but not too many. A modest starting interstitory, quite small, the other reactors, one and a half ton per gigawatt. Uh, very high thermal inertia, uh, it's a modest sized reactor and a lot of salt. Anything goes wrong, decay heat, transients, it takes a lot longer to heat things up. Uh, as with any practical design, it has a negative temperature coefficient, at least initially, and I'll get back to that in a second, uh, because in the disadvantages, disadvantage, it had a really complex and rapid need for fission product removal and much more R&D needed for that. Uh, the longer term reactivity coefficient, uh, the salt was fine, but as the salt heated up the graphite, which takes a little bit of time, it may have actually, the design might be slightly positive. Um, and to start, it needs either U233 or light water reactor transients, which are both sort of limited availability, and that can uh, slow down fleet deployment. Now, the DMSR in the late 70s was uh, Oak Ridge's attempt, well, let's try to really maximize proliferation resistance. What if we denature the uranium by having enough U238 so the uranium is useless for any weapons? It's already quite difficult because of the U232, but not impossible. Um, so. Added benefit that they never really talked about, uh, it has a much better reactivity coefficient, so there should be no danger of it being sort of accidentally positive as the MS original might have been. It's easy to start up on low enriched uranium, big plus, but it's got even more complex fission product removal to just barely break even. So a lot of, a couple uh, positives, but several negatives as well. Now the one and a half fluid design, that's where you have thorium and uranium in a central salt and then, or your core, and you surround that with a blanket. That's sort of the French design that they've come up with, or they've evolved to, uh, that has a uh, fuel salt in the, in the center. Only a radial blanket and then axial reflect reflector, so it's sort of a partial one and a half. Its advantages, uh, much lower daily processing rate than the, the traditional design, but the processing is just as complex. Uh, there's no graphite to really worry about, to replace or dispose of, etc. Very good reactivity coefficients, very sim quite simple core, um, and very high breeding ratios. They're in a faster spectrum than that, which there's pros and cons, a fair bit of cons to that. Uh, disadvantages though, uh, they're very large fazel inventory. Uh, it varies a bit depending on the age of their study, but five to eight tons per gigawatt is typical of either 233 or spent fuel plutonium, and that's the fizzol component, not just plutonium. We we'll have to add more for the other isotopes. Uh, they're now calling for a much higher operating temperature of 800, 850. They don't say this, but I'm pretty sure it's because they finally uh, had to admit that there was an issue with the solubility of uh, plutonium. All the other uranium, thorium, no problem getting enough in, but plutonium trifluorides, there's an issue there. Uh, they they have a lot of R&D for the materials, et cetera, on the, on the uh, reflectors. Uh, and the blanket salt might be all. I won't go into that much. And it's a very small thermal inertia. They're getting down to about 15 meter, cubic meters of salt for a gigawatt. Uh, so some problems there. Now the two fluid design of Oak Ridge, uh, I won't go through too many details, but here it's interlaced. We have this elaborate graphite plumbing uh, that tries to flow fuel salt that just has U233 with blanket salt between these pipes. Now it's got a lot of advantages, much smaller, uh, much simpler to remove fission product removal because thorium is so much like the rare earth fission products and we don't have it there. Uh, there's only graphite in the sort of strong neutron flux. It has a nice strong negative uh, temperature coefficient for the fissile salt and a very low fissile inventory, even better than the traditional design. 
Uh, disadvantages of the primary is that plumbing. It's just too complex. The uranium tends to shrink, uh, expand, and shrink, etc. Uh, that was their main uh, nightmare. And if it's single tube replaced, it was so complex, they'd have to replace the whole core. And the blanket salt, that would have a strongly positive temperature coefficient. If that blanket leaves the core or gets hotter, it's going to drive up. Now, what? why interlace two fluids? Now, I show one of, uh, like a slide from Kirk's here, and obviously he's not, Kirk is not trying to show that this is an actual design or anything like that. Uh, but if you do try to show, well, why don't we just make the central core uh, with the uranium-233, put a blanket all around that, okay? Uh, in principle, that's fine, but really only for low power overall total power, okay? And Oak Ridge often in the first paragraphs of the reports talked about this. Why not? Because if you don't interlace with concentrations that would be sort of able to break even, um, it's just fissile there. There's no fertile in the core, so the cores are quite small, and it's about a meter in diameter. And interesting, that that's with or without graphite. More salt without graphite, but it's not as reactive without the graphite. So uh, your power density is limited for many reasons, and because of that, if you stick to this short cylinder geometry, your total power is quite small. A couple tens of megawatts, that might be doable, but really hard to envision more than that. So what I've sort of come up with, which is, sounds dramatically <coughs> simple and quite obvious, is just going to a different geometry, cylindrical, long cylindrical geometry, to get that needed extra volume, to get a modest 100 to say 500 megawatts per, per core. Now that central core can have graphite or not. I sort of flip between what I prefer. Lately it's more without graphite, just a simple tube that, that flows the salt. So it's completely surrounded. Almost all your neutrons are going to be uh, uh, used, okay? Not really leaking like uh, this one. So the French have to worry about. Uh, I'm just showing another variation here, sort of a, a double wall, so you can really detect any leaks between the two. We always run the blankets all at higher density, so any leak would go inwards. All two fluids are like that. Now, the new concept's advantage is it doesn't really have that plumbing problem anymore. We just have one barrier to worry about. Strongly negative salt coefficients, but the blanket should also be nicely negative. As long as you don't put any reflective material, which uh, I'm a little mad at the French for doing, um, if that blanket gets thinner density, it's not going to reflect as many neutrons, so it should lower the um, coefficient. Uh, simple core, simple to design, etc. And a even lower fissile inventory, probably down to 400 kilograms per gigawatt or even lower. Uh, disadvantages, of course, as any. Uh, like any two fluid designs, we have that barrier that we're going to have to verify and prove. That's our technological uncertainty there uh, within a strong neutron flux. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned before, if there's any issue there, it's not really that much of a safety. We just run the blanket salt at higher level. If a leak develops, blanket salt moves in and it just shuts down the core. Uh, the core is not what we call sort of the minimal reactive shape, okay? Uh, but that's not really true for any two-fluid design. Even a two-fluid design that was a perfect sphere, less fuel salt can leak into the blanket and it's no longer minimal. You can say that, quote, for single fluid, there's nowhere for the fluid to go. Um, so in this case, if we're working with graphite, you probably want to run horizontal so the graphite could never sort of collapse into a bigger shape. Uh, but even in the worst case scenarios, we've got all those levels of, of containment. I can't see even the worst case scenario giving more than a, sort of an expensive mess. Um, and again, the critical issue is that core barrier blanket. We've got a lot of choices and a lot of work by others um, mainly in the fusion field that have looked at these same salts with incredibly much more harsh environments, first wall of a fusion wall, etc. They've looked at a lot of different things, molybdenum, silicon carbide, uh, even simple carbon composites. Hastelloy and the French have done a lot of work with, well, we need the materials for a high neutron flux uh, and even higher temperatures, so that, that's something that, and these tubes are, should be quite easily to replace. Uh, so even if we do have a five-year lifetime or something, it could still be good. So I'll finish up here. The tube and tube approach may offer the best overall breeder or break-even package. We really need a better word than breeder, and no one likes that. Um, uh, of course, though, there's still a lot of further evaluation to, and it's good to pursue several routes. Um, oh, I guess that was the... <laughs> I thought I had one more blown point there, but... Okay, so...